Well, good evening. Welcome back to our evening worship service, another opportunity that we've been blessed to gather together uh, around our screens and to worship the God who speaks to us through his word. A call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 137. I will read the first six verses. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. I will confess, in many ways, it's a bit of an odd call to worship. It doesn't feel like a call to worship. It feels like a compulsion to worship when someone doesn't feel as though they want to. But hopefully through this service, you'll recognize the appropriateness of this as a way of of putting us into the situation we're going to be looking at for this evening as, as a bit of our focus. But the, the focus will be um, on the emotions that we experience. And the invitation is that no matter how we feel, that we are here. We have heard the invitation of God to come and we've responded to that. And so now we come as we are into the presence of God, offering ourselves in this time of worship. And toward that end, let's begin by going to our God with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, you have called us. You have invited us into your presence. You have instructed us to take advantage of these regular routines to enter into your word. And again, while that might look very different for this season of time that we are in, we thank you that we still have this opportunity for the technology that connects us, for your word that binds us together, for the faith that we share. And I do pray that for all who have heard and have gathered together this evening, that your spirit would dwell among each and every one of us, and that in entering into this time, we would truly worship you, we would be encouraged by your word, and that having been here together, your name would be glorified, and we would be encouraged for our walk. All this we pray in the name of Christ, the one who connects us to the Father through the Spirit, Amen. Well, in some ways, our opening song of praise has a bit of an ironic title. It's Amid the Thronging Worshippers, and the best that I can do is is imagine you worshipers together here with me, but that is the promise. And so let us sing this song of praise to get our hearts into our, our, our focus of worship today. Let's stand wherever you are to sing the song Amid the Thronging Worshippers.
as we gather to offer our praise to the great king, the earth, the king of the earth, who is in heaven and on earth adored, God himself welcomes each and every one of us into his presence. And he does so with grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're standing, please take your seats. This morning in our worship service, we took the time to say the words of the Apostles' Creed together as a confession of faith and an understanding of God's grace given to us. And so this evening, we will turn, as we often do in the morning, to the words of the Ten Commandments, that instruction for our lives, that rule of faith, the way that God says, in order to have a right relationship with me, this is how you are to live. To live the best, most blessed way in the life, in the world that I have given to you as I have created it, conform your life to these rules. And so that is how we should hear that again this evening. It says, God spoke all of these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Again, the testimony of that is the acknowledgement of the fact that when we do conform our lives to the pattern of the world, we are lost. But when we conform it to the pattern of God's instructions, there we find life. In light of that, let us remain seated as we sing the song together, When We Walk with the Lord in the Light of His Word, What a Glory He Sheds on Our Way.
Well, we now enter into our time of prayer. And as we've been doing as of late, recognizing that our evening service time of sharing prayer requests hasn't been able to do this in terms of this version, we've been focusing that in our midweek prayer services, which just a reminder will be taking place on Thursday of this week. We've been trying to find ways to encourage more of a personal time of prayer time where you can enter into the presence of God in different ways, and we're going to do that again this evening. As we will see, as I sort of already alluded to, we'll be focusing a lot on emotions uh, this evening. And so that's the, the framework for the prayer that I'll be praying. I'll be leading you in a bit of a description of an emotion and then encourage you to Reflect upon that yourself and say your own silent prayer, or you may say it out loud. I'll give you a time and, and pause where you can pray on, uh, to the Lord. And if it, the time I give you isn't long enough, the blessing of this method is you can just pause the video for a little bit, conclude your time of prayer, and then just pick up wherever we were that we left off. The one thing that I do want to highlight is our, our normal offering schedule this evening was for the Wycliffe Bible Translators, so we'll be including them in our prayer, and we encourage you to include them in your thoughts as you consider the giving that uh, would have taken place during these regular worship services. So will you join with me in a time of prayer together? Lord God and Heavenly Father, what a blessed call to trust and obey you. Lord, we dare not sing that or even ask people to do that, or we wouldn't even instruct ourselves to that if you were not a trustworthy God, worthy of our obedience. And we thank you for being exactly that God. We thank you that you are a God who has forever been faithful, a God that when he speaks, we know will act, a God in whom we can rely upon, who doesn't change with the shifting sand or with the tides of time, but that you are forever our rock, a reliable source of of hope and instruction. And so we do turn to you this evening because while you are trustworthy, we are not. We are a fickle people. We are a people who are controlled by our compulsions and oftentimes by our emotions. And so this evening we we lay before you who we are in all of our emotional complexity. We begin by turning to you our joy. For thinking about that which brings us delight in our lives and offering up to you our gratitude for those things. Thank you, Lord, for the things that bring us joy and happiness. Lord, we also are a people who have anxiety We must turn to you in trust because you know the future, but for us, the future is unknown. And oftentimes that rises up worries and concerns, anxiety and fear. And so now we lay our fear before you as well. Hear the areas where we are concerned. Hear our anxieties about the future, about what is unknown as we place that at your throne. While it is the future that often motivates our fear, it is the present that can often stir up, stir up in us anger. As we look around the world, there are things that upset us. There are things that aren't the way that we want them to be. There are things that frustrate us and, and cause us anger, some of which is righteous and good, much of which is selfish. So Lord, we lay our anger before you.
And finally, we lay before you our sadness. In the world, as we look around it, we know that you grieve because it's not the way that you made it. And again, as we look at the world around us, we too grieve because the world is not the way that it is supposed to be. We recognize areas of injustice. We see the effects of sin in our lives, in the lives of others. There are things that we regret, and that regret just causes us grief. And in our sadness, we turn to you. Father God, we turn to you in all of these things because you alone are the God of hope and the God of comfort. That in our emotional turns, you are always reliable. But even more than that, that you are a God that understands. That in Jesus, you knew what it was to be joyful. You knew what it was to be upset. You knew what it was to grieve. And you can relate to us in all of those things, and we thank you for that. We thank you for your love and the comfort we get in just being able to unburden ourselves before you. Lord, all of that is spoken of in your holy word, that word that we rely upon and cling to. And we thank you for the fact that that word has been given to us in a way that we can understand, a gift and a benefit that is, is not at all what has been the case throughout time and even isn't the case around the world, that there are still tribes and tongues for whom your word has not yet been revealed in their own language. And we thank you for the work of Wycliffe Bible translators as they seek to do exactly that. Bless their translators. Protect their translations from those who would come in and distort it or twist it and conflict with what they see there. And then, Lord, may your word go forth, and as it does, may it build your kingdom, may it change lives, may it help many come to know of your incredible love. And so, Lord, as we pray for Wycliffe Bible translators, may they be blessed, and may we also find ways to support that ministry through our offerings. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, we have spoken to the Lord in prayer, and now he will speak to us in his word. But before we do that, approaching his word, we confess that we need our God and his instructions, and that is our song of preparation. Will you please stand with me as we sing the song, Lord, I Need You.
Well, if you're standing, please take a seat. Okay, uh, this morning we started a new sermon series on the book of Galatians. And if you've been following along with us, you will know that last Sunday evening we concluded finally our long sermon series on the book of Jeremiah. Having joked on it the last couple of weeks, I did look at when we began that sermon series. We actually started it on the last Sunday in October of 2018. There was a couple of interruptions in there, but we've been in Jeremiah for quite some time. But that, of course, leads to the question, where do we go next? What are we going to do in our evening worship service? And as I tried to think about that, I contemplated a couple of things. I thought about where we are right now in the current odd circumstances that we find ourselves in, wanting to maybe find something that we could a little more directly relate to what we're experiencing. And then I also thought about where we had been and if we could take advantage of the things that we've been recently studying. And when you kind of put those two things together, what seemed abundantly clear and logical is why not look at the book of Lamentations, the book right after Jeremiah. And so that's what we're going to do over the next uh, couple of weeks. We're going to be examining the, the short book of Lamentations. But before we start there, kind of like we had to do this morning, you always want to have a bit of a background to every book to understand the text and kind of set the framework for where we're headed. Lamentations is a book that was written in response to the fall of Jerusalem. And so in terms of placing this book in time, we don't have to move at all. We're exactly where we have been right around the year 586 or shortly thereafter, after the fall of Jerusalem. And in fact, tradition has it, although we don't know for sure, that Jeremiah was the author of the book of Lamentations. So again, having been through the entire book of, of Jeremiah, we now go right with him into the book of Lamentations. And so the author and the setting haven't really changed at all. But what is key to the interpretation and understanding of this book as a whole is the identification of its genre. So last week at the end of Jeremiah in chapter 52, we saw a narrative description of the fall of Jerusalem. It told the story. It gave the details of what happened, who was involved, who did what, where, and when. That's a, a narrative description. But Lamentations isn't a narrative. It isn't really interested in the details of what happened so much as it is interested in the emotional reaction to what happened. As the title suggests, the book is a lament or a collection of laments, lamentations. A lament is defined in the dictionary as a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. The fall of Jerusalem was a terribly devastating thing. Everything that the people had known, all that they had trusted in, their past inheritance and their future hope was tied up in this city, in their king on the throne, in the temple and the worship that took place, and now all of that is gone. And that affected people emotionally. And this book helps us to see how. And it models approaching God during times of grief. Now, before we read the book of Lamentations or the text of, of Lamentations 1, there's a few things that I have to tell you that are there, but we're not going to be able to recognize or see in the English translation that we'll be using. As poems or potentially even as songs intended to be sung, Lamentations is a very carefully and beautifully crafted writing. First of all, chapters 1 through 4 are all acrostics. 
you will notice that chapters 1, 2, and 4 all have 22 verses. And that's because each verse starts with one of the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. You'll notice the one exception to that is chapter 3 that actually has 66 verses. It's not any longer than the other chapters, but each one of the three lines in the poem starts with a new letter of the alphabet and so, or, or the same letter of the alphabet, so they just divided it more closely, and so it's 66 verses instead of the 22. And many people have asked, well, is there a reason for this acrostic? Some suggesting that what it's communicating is we need every letter of the alphabet to communicate our grief. That the destruction is so vast, it's covering every area of our life that we have to go from A to Z, as it were, to describe how much our lives are in devastation. Or others have suggested that in this world of absolute chaos and disorder, that this acrostic structure is an attempt to try to bring some form of order or orderliness to this awfully chaotic time of life. And so you're going to miss the acrostic description here. You're also going to miss the meter, the, the rhythm that is in this poem. In the Hebrew, that would be communicated. And in fact, in the Hebrew, the meter that is used is actually the meter that would have been used for more of a traditional funeral dirge. An analogy would be is if you're a musician, you were writing this, you'd put it in the minor key, a key that by itself communicates more of a sad, anxious, fearful, somber tone. And so again, that's something that we're going to miss in the English, but it's important to know. So let's go ahead and, and get into the book of Lamentations. And because it's about emotions, as I read through chapter 1, what I want to encourage you to do is to listen for the emotions that are present here, to identify the feelings, because after all, those feelings in many ways might come off as, as even more important than the content of the text. So follow along as I read from the first chapter of the book of Lamentations. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become. She who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave she weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before their pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her afflictions and wanderings all the precious things that were hers from days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her, her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, she became filthy. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She, looks, she, took, not, she took no thought of her future. Therefore, her fall is terrible. 
She has no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those who you forbade to enter her congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see, for I am despised. Is nothing in you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted in the day of his fierce anger. For on high he sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all the day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke. But this hand they have fastened together. They were set upon my neck. He caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I cannot withstand. The Lord rejected all my mighty men in, their, in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as, it, as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things... I weep. My eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors shall be foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right. For I have rebelled against his word. But hear, all you peoples, and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. They heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. You have brought the day you announced. Now let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my transgressions, for my groans are many and my heart is faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I suggested, we are paying attention to the emotions in the text And I want to agree with one of the commentators that I read that suggests that we in the church often have a better time, an easier time of dealing with certain emotions than we do with others. For example, we have an easy time dealing with the emotions of praise. Many of our calls to worship often are psalms of praise, getting us to think about the good things that God has given to us and the response that we should give of joy and happiness, of gratitude and appreciation. After all, we have in front of us almost every Sunday a praise team. Think about how different that would sound, again, as one commentator suggested, if we had a lament team in front of us. So so praise we know, praise we can handle. And I would even suggest that we also know how to handle the emotion of, of anger, at least as church members. I think we can see a lot of that right now. Anger is our emotional reaction to when things are not how they are supposed to be. When we see injustice, when we think we think we're being treated unfairly, then we often resort to anger. We think that we can scowl, yell, protest, and, and we try to let people know that we're not happy about the way that things are going. And so we express that in our anger. 
But again, I agree that one of the emotions that we can have a harder time expressing as a church is that emotion of lament. The feeling of, of grief. Now, sure, we give room for that in our culture or by ourselves, but we don't often know how to handle that as a community. Go off and, and cry the necessary tears by yourself, but once those tears are dried, come back together, pull yourself together, and let's move on. But in our text, that's where Judah is. They are lamenting. Lament is the sorrow that comes when things are hard and tough and we, we don't know what we could do about it if there is anything that can be done to change it. We just feel stuck. And that, in a lot of ways, is the struggle of Lamentations chapter 1. While we may not have the, the narrative description of what took place in the fall of Jerusalem, we certainly have poetic details about how what took place has affected these people. And we see that in a lot of the contrasts that are drawn in our chapter. They look around and, and they say, whereas Jerusalem used to be great, now it is laid low. Where Judah used to be like a, a princess, now she has become a slave. Where she used to have children that ran with joy, her children have now gone into exile and are no more. Much of the source of this grief is knowing what once was, what was supposed to be compared to what is now seen. And again, isn't that something that many of us can relate to? As we think back to what was normal only a few weeks ago compared to what is now. We think about how we used to just send our children off to school or we would let them go and play with their friends and that's where we would meet our friends. Now we're stuck at home. We think about events that we were looking forward to, vacations, programs, uh, celebrations, and now many of those have been canceled and we're separated from community. When compared to where we were, where we are now, it's hard and that hurts. Many grieve. But at least the author is honest enough to explain why this grief has come. Some other laments that we have in the Bible, and there are many, many in the Psalms, for example, are laments of, of righteousness. They are the prayers of people that say, Lord, I haven't done anything wrong. I am just, and yet my enemies are treating me unjustly, and so I'm looking to you for the, the revenge, for the vengeance that I seek, and I trust that you will provide it. This is not fair, and so I know you're going to fix it. But that's not what we have in Lamentations. In verse 8, it says, Jerusalem sinned grievously, therefore she has become filthy. In verse 18, the Lord is right, for I have rebelled. In verse 20, my heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. So Lamentations is not the cry of the righteous grieving over unfair treatment. Instead, it is the grief of the one who has to confess, I screwed up. I know that the devastation that I'm experiencing now is my own fault. And the choices, the wrong and bad choices that I made in the past have led me to this point that I'm in right now. Now, to be clear, because I was drawing some parallels earlier between what they were going through back then and where we we're going to right now, I don't think that what we are experiencing with this COVID-19 is a direct judgment to God up, of God upon us. 
Now, to be clear, it is a part of and a result of living in this sinful, broken world that we live in. And I don't think it's unfair for us to explore and think about what we may need to repent of as a nation or as an individual or as a world, but I don't see it as direct punishment. But I do know when, of times, and and for myself and others, when we've been in these circumstances, where the grief we experience has to come with a bit of confession saying, you know what, the reason why I'm experiencing the struggles I'm experiencing right now is because of the mistakes that I've made. And the extra burden that creates then is, well, where do you go for relief from that? And again, as we listen for emotions, that's a clear theme in our text. There's the repeated appeal for Judah, or from Judah, for having people look. Look at me, people who pass by. Look at me, God. Look at what I'm going through. And when you see the trials and the struggles that I'm having and the sorrow that I'm experiencing, won't that create sympathy in your heart? And that then parallels to the very, the the other common theme that we see is the cry for comfort. I want just something to come along to be that comfort, to bring me relief, someone to tell me it's going to be okay. But in that search, no comfort is found. And again, we see in the text the reason for that. We have reference in our text to the lovers. Many people think that these are the false gods that Judah had run off to in the past. These idols that had promised them all of these wonderful things that they had searched for. These different ways of worshiping. These freedoms that they wanted to know. And now they see that those lovers have abandoned them. And they're exposed for the emptiness that they are. There's reference to friends, and and many people think that these friends are the other nations that Judah had allied with and, and made compacts with for protection and for security. And now, when things have gone bad, those friends have abandoned Judah and, in fact, are their enemy of Judah, mocking and laughing as what has happened to them. And so there's no comfort in their friends. Now, of course, they knew And we know that they should be turning to God to find the comfort that they need as they do. But do you see the problem in trying to turn to God? Especially in verses like 12 through 15, we recognize that God is actually the source of these struggles. God is the one that has afflicted these, them in these times. And we read, for example, in Lamentations 1.13, From on high he sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint, all the day long. So especially given the confession that they were the ones that have messed this up, How can now you turn to God and ask the one who brought this struggle to also be the one to bring the comfort and the relief that I'm needing? So how do you approach a God with those emotions? Will God still hear you? Does God still care? And the wonderful answer to those really hard questions is yes. Yes, you still can turn to God in the acknowledgement of your sin. In fact, that's exactly what he wants. Yes, you can still look to God for the comfort that you desire. Yes, you can turn to God because the truth is there's nowhere else, there's no one else that you can turn to. Nothing will bring you the comfort that you need and seek except for God. Only God can fix what we broke. And so we need to turn to him in confession and in the request for his mercy to again be given to us. That what was hoped for and longed for in the text 
And the wonderful thing about us in the New Testament age is we can see that's exactly what God provided to us in Jesus Christ. In the relationship that we broke, in what we ruined, and in the destruction that we've brought upon our own lives, God says, I'll be the one to fix it by sending my son to pay the penalty for your sin and to rise to new life to give you life. And that is actually the joy in this text. Even when you're grieved, even when your world is falling apart, and yes, even when you know it's your fault that your world is falling apart, God still loves you. God still says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God still wants you to bring all of your emotions to him and to come to him with your praise with your anger, and with your grief. And what a great testimony the book of Lamentations is that in that regard, that even when we are sad and, and when you don't feel like coming to God or even know if you can, God still invites you into his arms of comfort. So that's what I want us to be thinking about this evening. I know we all know right now, a lot of us have been struggling with our emotions. We're a mess, jumping back and forth depending on what we read or, or who we see or, or what we miss or what reminders come up on our calendar. And we just struggle with how to react and where do we find relief for those emotions. And so what do we do with those emotions? As you have been experiencing them in your life, where have you been going for the comfort that you want? Have you been going to the idols of distraction, letting the hours tick by as you waste them? Have you gone to the idols of information, assuming, well, if I can just figure this out for myself, if I can become informed and know what's going on, that'll tell me how to act, and then I can convince other people, and we'll move forward and get past this. Have you been running to the idols of substances that will numb or dull your emotions? All of those are emptied lovers. So then what about friends? Do you run to friends and, and com come with, with packs that you can make where we can discuss these emotions together? Or actually, have you experienced a separation from some of your friends because you don't quite see eye to eye in what's going on or how to react? And, and now there's a division. Now there's a potential that you're becoming enemies and, and separated. Our friends can't always be relied upon. But what a joy to know that our God is always there. That our God doesn't need us to hide our grief or to fake our emotions or to pretend like the pain isn't there. But our God still invites us to come as we are, how we feel, to unburden ourselves before him. And he is the God that not only will provide comfort, but he is the only one who can comfort us in our time of grief. So may we turn to him at all times, in every way. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, uh, we are in strange times that have brought about a lot of conflicting emotions, but in that, may we turn to you. And in turning to you, what a joy to know that you are there. That although we are people that have sought after idols, we confess that we recognize them to be empty lovers, and so we turn back to you. While we have been people that have cried out for our friends, for solace and for comfort, 
we know that only you can be relied upon and trusted because only you can fix what we've broken. And what a great God you are that despite the fact that we have turned our back on you in rebellion, you are a God who continues to pursue us in love. Thank you for being that God of comfort. Hear especially this evening the cries of those that have cause for grief, who've been especially anxious during this time. For those who have lost much and they look at their life as it is and all that they experience is nothing but sorrow. I pray that by turning to you that they especially would find the comfort that only you can bring. And I pray this in the name of the risen Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, that testimony was that there's nothing that we can do to fix what we have broken, but we must turn to our Heavenly Father for that fixing. And our, that's our song of application. So once again, at home, you're invited to stand with us as we sing together the song, Not What My Hands Have Done. Song. now as we move from this time of worship, we are blessed with these words from 1 Peter 5, 10 and 11. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our closing song is Step by Step. <laughs> 